In the last segment, we talked about conventional economics, about how the market for coal or potatoes works. And we saw that the market clearing price in price competition is the marginal cost of production. Now this gives us an insight into a really important feature about information markets, which is that information wants to be free in the EFS slogan. And this is why, for example, Wikipedia, the world's encyclopedia, is free, whereas its predecessor, the Encyclopedia Britannica, used to cost thousands of dollars. Why? Because the cost of producing an extra copy of Wikipedia is nothing. And there's nothing to stop the price being free, which is the natural price for information. And we can see the development of this historically, for example, with the New York phone book, which started out costing $10,000 when the phone company 9X had a monopoly. As soon as, as another company, ProCD, came along and had the phone book retyped, they started selling it at $300, so 9X had to sell it at $300 too. Then ABI joined in and pretty soon the price of the phone book was just a few dollars that it cost to distribute the CD. Or you can get it online for free in return for looking at a few ads. So the big question facing the information industries is how do you make money out of this stuff? How do you make money from selling software or books or music or films or anything else? So there are three key things here. The first is lock-in, because often buying a product commits you to acquiring complementary assets, such as you buy apps for your phone, you buy software for your um, laptop, you buy games for a console, you buy music to go on your iPod. You also invest in learning skills, so that, for example, if you buy an, an Apple Mac, you learn how to use that, and if you buy a Windows laptop, you learn how to use that instead. And retraining from one to another is doable, but it's a bit of a bother. And the third thing that you might invest in is buying services. So when you buy a mobile phone, you buy network services for it. Now, exactly the same thing goes for services. So your mobile phone company tries to lock you in in various ways, with offers and plans and minutes and so on. Google tries to lock you into its search by offering you Gmail and Maps and so on that work a little bit with, better with their product than with other people's products. And in all sorts of little ways, service operators try and make it expensive for people to switch to their competitors. Now, there's a really interesting result here by Carl Shapiro and Hal Varian from the late 1990s, which is that the net present value of your customer base is just the total cost of switching. To see this, suppose that you're a law firm, for example, and you've got 100 staff who sue people and um, you've paid Microsoft $200 so that for each of these staff so they can have a copy of Office and Windows and everything that goes with that. Now, how much would it cost your company to switch to LibreOffice or Google Docs or any other competitor? The answer is, if you're a typical firm at the margin, $20,000. Uh, because if it would cost more than this, then you'd switch. And if it would cost less, then Microsoft would put up its prices. So a firm's net worth is the total switching cost of all its customers. And this is really key to understanding the industry. Because if you're the incumbent, if you're my phone company, you will try and uh, cause me to not leave you by um, offering me extra minutes, for example, or extra text if I threaten to switch. If you're the supplier of my laptop, uh, if you're Apple as opposed to Microsoft, for example, you will see to it that people who write software for your product can't as easily write it for other people, or at least they have to go to some bother to make software available for multiple formats. And you can have all sorts of funny business going on, uh, from technical lock-in for uh, printer cartridges, for example, to uh, ancillary services, payment services, and all sorts of tricks which are used to bind customers into a particular ecosystem. And in fact, an awful lot of the stuff that people do in information security nowadays is about this. Cryptography um, found one of its biggest commercial uses when Xerox started using cryptography to tie printers to cartridges. And switching can be asymmetric. In mobile networks, for example, um, if I'm about to leave a phone company, they can bribe me to stay by offering me thousands of free minutes, which costs them nothing. Uh, but the phone company that wants to win my business maybe has to give me a free phone, and that's a real cost. So in addition to these games, there's another factor that's very important, which is network externalities or network effects. And many networks become more valuable to each user the more people use them. Now, Bob Metcalf, the inventor of Ethernet, um, 
produced net cast law, as it's called, that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of users. In reality, it's slightly more complex, but that gives a good flavor of it, that the more users you have, the more valuable the network is to each of them. And these superlinear returns to scale have a number of effects. One is that networks tend to grow slowly in the beginning and then take off with a great whoosh once they reach critical mass as the phone did at the beginning of the 20th century and faxes in about 1985 and email in about 1995. Another interesting thing is that in addition to real networks like phones or fax or email or um, Facebook, there are virtual networks such as PCs and software or phones and the apps that go with them. Back in the 80s, for example, when the PC was fighting with the Mac for dominance of the personal computer market, we all used to write software for both the PC and the Mac for a while because we didn't know which was going to win. But around about 1985, it became clear that um, the PC was likely to win, and so then everybody started developing PC for the uh, software for the PC uh, first, and then only later for the Mac, if at all. And that meant that everybody bought PCs because there was more software, and that meant that everybody developed software for the PC because there were more users, and this virtuous circle made Microsoft its enormous fortune. And the same thing has happened again and again and again in other markets, starting from mainframes in the 1960s through mini computers in the 1970s, through to mobile phones and social networks very recently. Now, it's also interesting that this isn't just about good stuff like legitimate apps. It's also about bad stuff like malware. Now, malware writers also target Windows, um, although Mac and Linux are equally vulnerable, simply because there are more infectable machines running Windows. And if how you make your living is infecting hundreds of millions of machines a year and selling them at two cents each to the spammers, you'll make an awful lot more money infecting Windows boxes than trying to attack Macs. So what goes around comes around, and success is a sword that has two edges, at least some of the time. So how come security is hard? Well, here's the key insight that each of these factors, low marginal cost, technical lock-in and network externalities, tends to lead to a dominant firm market model, to a monopoly, right? And with all three together, monopoly is even more likely. That's why our industry is rife with monopolies, and that's why the race to dominate a new emerging market is so important. There are billions and billions of dollars up for grabs. And that's why in the 1990s, Microsoft had this philosophy of ship it Tuesday and get it right by version 3. That's what people actually said on the Microsoft campus in Redmond. And the rest of the industry was scathing. They said these guys are not serious. They're hackers. They're producing crap software. But I think that by now you'll realize that whatever firm had won the market for the PC operating system would have acted the same way. And perhaps if Steve Jobs had been a bit less of a perfectionist, then Apple would have become the world's biggest company in the 1980s rather than um, a few years ago. Anyway, so that's why we have monopolies. Now, what's the effect of monopoly? Well, this is interesting. Now, on the graph here, we can see supply and demand for apartments in a typical town, such as Cambridge, where I teach. Now, suppose the... Um, demand is from one person, one rich student who can pay £2,000 for an apartment and a couple who can pay 1900 and then a couple who can pay 1800 and so on, until you've got 300 students who could pay £1,000 or more and 1,000 students who could pay £500 or more. Now, as the supply is fixed, and let's suppose it's 1,000 apartments, um, the market equilibrium price P star under competition will be just where supply and demand cross, that is at £500 for the rent of an apartment. And that means that the guy whose budget is 2000 ends up with a £1,500 surplus that he can go and spend on whatever he likes. Now, suppose the market gets rigged. Suppose the landlords get together and form a cartel. Or suppose one rich guy just goes, out, goes and buys all the rental apartments. He then looks at the supply and demand curve and he says, now hang on a minute, if I keep 200 flats empty, then I can rent 800 flats at £700 per month, which will earn me an awful lot more than 1,000 flats at £500 a month. So he keeps 200 flats empty, but hey, this is inefficient. 
because there's 200 empty flats that people would have paid perfectly good money to rent. It's just that they won't pay £700, which is the optimum price for the monopolist, if everybody has to pay the same rent. So what's the fix? Well, the fix for the monopolist is to get everybody to pay different rents. And in fact, the ideal situation for a monopolist to be in is to know everything about everybody. So that he knows that the student from Saudi Arabia can afford £2,000 a month for rent, so that's what he gets charged. And he knows that the two students from Bahrain can afford 1900 so that's what they have to pay. All the way down to the poor student from Bangladesh who has charged his entire budget of £500 a month. And now, the monopolist gets the lot. Note that this is Pareto efficient, because there's no way you can give anybody um, anything better without somebody losing something. So this is the secret of an efficient monopoly. Know everything about everybody and charge them exactly their marginal propensity to pay. And this is how monopoly and technology come together. Monopolies are common in the information goods and services industries because of network effects, because of lock-in and because of low marginal costs. But then monopolists will try to price discriminate to mop up all the available surplus and they'll also try and collect information on us. But the existence of information services pervasively throughout our lives and everything that we do and touch nowadays mean that the monopolist is in a position to do that. And this means that software industry type techniques related to monopoly are becoming ever more pervasive, not just in the software industry, but in other concentrated industries such as airline tickets, cars, hotels, and potentially spreading to just about everything else as well where there isn't some good reason for the market to remain price competitive. In summary, complex socio-technical systems often fail because of poorly aligned incentives, and one of the most important causes is externalities, that is, the side effects that transactions have, very often network effects. These are particular, uh, particularly pervasive in the information goods and services industries, and they're now spreading everywhere else as well.